Welcome back to Change the World and I'm just done booking AEW Full House, the fourth pay-per-view in the company's history and the first of the Tuesday Night Dynamite era. We have seven matches on the card, three of which are title matches, the others various personal differences that have arose over the past seven weeks. So with that said, let's run the show. Full House opens up with a pay-per-view video package promoting the show, particularly focusing on the three championship matches that we'll see at the end of the night. There is also a focus on the building and the city that the show will take place in. This is trying to give an important feel to the pay-per-view over a standard episode of Tuesday Night Dynamite. Following the video package, we'll take a look around the arena as Pyro goes off to open Full House. The commentators will then introduce the show, putting over the fact that we are in the Toyota Center in Houston, Texas, as well as discussing the three title matches that will take place tonight. They put over the fact that the first ever AW World Tag Team Championship match would main event the show. This will bring them to the opening match of the evening, Cody Rhodes and MJF v Hangman Page and Marty Skrull. This will lead into a video package, highlighting the issues between the two sides, beginning before Marty Skrull even joined AEW. Feeling that the villain's time with the Elite was up, Cody looked to replace him and found a protege in MJF who he felt could live up to the Elite moniker. When Marty Skrull joined AEW, making a surprise debut with a victory over Cody in under a minute at Double or Nothing, it was clear that he was far from finished with the Elite. Since then, issues within the Elite have revolved around Cody's relationship with MJF and the rest of the group's lament at his inability to see the true colours of the cocky, arrogant, self-serving MJF. We then go into that opening match, Hangman Page and Marty Skrull defeating Cody and MJF in 12 minutes 15 when Hangman Page pinned MJF. During the match, Cody Rhodes injured his knee falling off the apron onto the ground, leaving MJF to fight the two of them alone. Page is then able to get the pin over MJF, a 57 C- rating, not too bad, Cody standing out particularly, Marty Skrull doing well as well, MJF and Hangman Page somewhat below that. But nonetheless, a victory for Hangman Page and Marty Skrull while trying to keep Cody somewhat strong with the injury angle. After the match, MGF will crawl over to check on his injured mentor. Despite the celebrations, Hangman Page and Marty will also be concerned for Cody, who has previously had surgery on that knee. As the two of them leave together, Cody will be helped with his feet by MGF, who stays with him as the two of them struggle to the back. MGF having to dealt with Hangman Page and Marty Skrull while Cody again with that injury. We then take a look back at a media event from earlier in the day with Brandy Rhodes gathered to promote the Full House pay-per-view. Brandy Rhodes made a number of references to the Men's World Tag Team Championships, suggesting that a women's tag team title was coming to All Elite soon. She also announced the signing of Tennille Dashwood to an AEW contract, saying that she would be present at Full House. This would lead into footage from earlier today, Tennille Dashwood arriving at the building, the newest member of the AEW roster. Tennille Dashwood was joined by her friend, Danielle Monet, formerly Summer Rae in the WWE, with no word on whether Monet had also signed a deal with the company. After they were greeted by a beaming Brandy Rhodes, Dashwood gave a few words to the AW cameras, saying that she was delighted to be all elite. So we've debuted to Neil Dashwood there, but we've also brought in the former Summer Rae from WWE. I'm not sure how involved she's going to be in ring, because it's not really something that she's pursued since leaving WWE, but I think that at least having her, even just as the valet of Tennille Dashwood, helps boost the profile and make Dashwood appear more like a main event star. We then go into the second match, Mizuki defeating B Priestley in 10 minutes 3 with a cutie special. The story of the match is B Priestley thinking that she's the better of the two, confident that she'd pick up the victory, only to be surprised by Mizuki defeating her and outclassing her during the match. Question marks once again over B Priestley's attitude as she saw herself as the heavy favourite going into the match. Mizuki celebrates in the ring a 27E rating. The commentators then send over to an interview with the Young Bucks, who are preparing for the World Tag Team Championship match in the main event. Nick and Matt put over their long-term rivalry with the Lucha Bros going back to 10 months ago when they were attacked on their own stage in Las Vegas. Since then, the tension between the two has escalated and the Young Bucks defeated the Lucha Bros at Double or Nothing. Matt points out that four nights ago on Tuesday Night Dynamite, the Young Bucks brought things full circle with a super kick to each of the Lucha Bros in the middle of the ring. Nick adds that a lot has changed since May's Double or Nothing, but the result of the match will be the same, as the Young Bucks fulfil their destiny, becoming the first ever AW World Tag Team Champions. 
We then look towards the next match, the commentators introducing a video package looking at Chris Jericho. The focus of the package is the aloof, bigger than the company attitude that Chris Jericho has shown since signing with AEW and his campaign particularly against Joey Ryan, who he saw as a symbol of everything AEW shouldn't be doing. In recent weeks, this has gone to another level as the self-proclaimed GOAT decided that he called the shots on his own schedule, no showing an interview which had been set up by AEW where somebody had flown out to his hometown to speak to him. This was followed by a short montage promoting his opponent for the night, El Tejano. A 64C rated match, not particularly good. Chris Jericho getting a 73, El Tejano only a 58. Chris Jericho defeating El Tejano in 12 minutes and 55 with a code breaker, a brutal physical brawl. Chris Jericho bending the rules but not necessarily breaking them and allowing him to pick up the victory with a code breaker. After the match, Chris Jericho is barely even cracks a smile as he celebrates his victory. His hand is raised while he is snarling down at the man who he had just defeated. The commentators put over the fight of El Tejano as Chris Jericho headed to the back, just as wound up, bitter and angry as he was coming into the match. Looking towards the AW Men's World Championship match later in the night, Kenny Omega will be interviewed by Alex Marvez. Omega will put over the tag team main event before focusing on the threat that Pac poses to his AW World Championship. Omega will say that Pac came closer all out, and since then, he's proved himself against a number of members of the Elite. Kenny Omega will say that the first title defence is always difficult, and he couldn't have asked for a tougher opponent than Pac. As he speaks, putting over Pac some more, Cody will stumble in, followed by MGF. He's clearly still hurt from his injury early in the night, and seems unbalanced both physically and mentally. Patting Kenny on the shoulder, Cody will wish him luck, taking a glance at his championship before leaving. Kenny will be put off by Cody's strange behaviour, shaking his head as Cody walks off. A video package will then promote Tessa Blanchard v Eva Lise Velez, a number of physical and verbal altercations between the two leading to this match. Both women are cocky and confident and sure of their abilities and that's led to a clash as both of them look to become the next AW Women's World Champion. With Tessa Blanchard already in the ring, Eva Lise Velez will make her entrance but stop at the top of the ramp. Holding the microphone in her hand, she will call for her music to be cut. Ivelisse will tell the audience that after what Tessa Blanchard has said about her, she's going to make her pay tonight. Ivelisse explains that nobody gets away with disrespecting her, and that's why she's brought back up. Introducing her big sister, Ivelisse Velez brings out Mercedes Martinez, who will join her at ringside for the match. Another debut in the women's roster, again we're looking to establish some partnerships, friendships and tag teams as we look to bring in the AW women's tag team titles. Mercedes Martinez will have an effect at ringside but Tessa Blanchard will be able to defeat Ivelisse Velez in 11 minutes 25 with a hammerlock DDT. Uh, Mercedes Martinez will be kicked out from ringside after she tries to get involved one too many times during the match. This will leave it to a fair one-on-one -on -one match with Blanchard's talent overcoming Ivelisse Velez's attempts to cheat. After the match, Tessa will stand tall in the ring celebrating. The commentators will put over that having come close to defeat before Martinez was ejected, Tessa Blanchard has put herself right in the mix to be the number one contender to the AW Women's World Championship. This will give them chance to put over the fact that Britt Baker will defend her title later in the evening against Madison Eagles. We'll then have another video package introduced by the commentators promoting the next match, Pax Crusade against the Elite, the story of the build to the AW Men's World Championship match. He feels that the company was set up to support Kenny and Co, allowing them to maintain their positions at the top of the card at the expense of everybody else. Pax used All Out and his defeat to Omega as evidence of this and has vowed to take out every single member of the Elite this led to the match with Kenny Omega being confirmed for full house for the AW Men's World Championship. Pac feels that it is his duty to upset the balance and ensure that AW doesn't remain the playground of the elite. A 75B- rating, a pretty good rating there for the first defence of Kenny Omega's AEW Men's World title. A match that had superb wrestling but only decent reaction from the crowd. Kenny Omega defeating Pac in 21-59 with a one-winged angel. Kenny getting an 83 there, Pat getting a 74, two of the best, most consistent performers in the company, so it's not a surprise there to see them put on a very good match. We'll see later whether it was the right decision to put them out of the main event in favour of the tag team titles. As it stands, to me, it seems unlikely that the main event is going to beat that. After the match, Kenny Omega celebrates. He has retained the AEW Men's World Championship. 
Another interview will then take place, Alex Marvez talking to the Lucha Bros ahead of the main event match for the AW World Tag Team Championships. Phoenix and Pentagon will talk about the defeats of the Young Bucks at Double or Nothing, pointing out that at the time they faced, there was nothing on the line. With Ray taking the lead in the promo, he will say that one match didn't prove that the Young Bucks were the best tag team in the world, but tonight's match has the chance to do just that. The Lucha Bros vowed to raise their game, promising to walk out of Full House as the first ever World Tag Team Champions of AEW. We then get a video package for the Women's World Championship match. On the first episode of Tuesday Night Dynamite, Britt Baker became the champion, defeating B Priestley in the first AEW Women's World Championship match. Madison Eagles debuted the following week on Tuesday Night Dynamite and has bulldozed her way through the women's roster since that date. She earned a place in a number one contendership match against Yuka Sakazaki, but an injury to the TJPW star forced changes to be made to that match. Madison Eagles came through though as number one contender and has since put over the fact that she didn't come to AEW with fanfare or with a huge announcement, but she has earned her way to the top of the card. At Full House, her intention is to become the AEW Women's World Champion. In the second last match of the night, Britt Baker defeats Madison Eagles in just 8 minutes and 27 by pinfall with a fast roll up, again the first title defence made of the AW Women's World title. The two didn't click which brought the match down, that's probably the worst match that Madison Eagles had so far so that is very disappointing. A 29 from Britt Baker, really not good enough from the champion and Madison Eagles 46 probably dragged the match up a bit but not as much as we would have liked. I'm not completely surprised and as you can see there the match was designed to bring the fans a little bit more down before that main event but the story of the match Madison Eagles pretty much dominating from the opening bell beating down overpowering the champion but the underdog Britt Baker rolling up Madison Eagles for the one two three after the match Britt Baker celebrates in the ring Excalibur putting over that quote from Madison Eagles what sort of champion comes into her own title match as the underdog Whatever Madison Eagles had to say, Britt Baker has proved her wrong, retaining the title here at Full House. Coming between the two final matches, Brandy Rhodes gives an update ahead of the main event, admitting that Cody is injured and his knee injury appears to have flared up again. He will receive a scan tomorrow to see the full extent, but understandably Cody is frustrated by this. Rhodes will also put over the main event, once again referring to men's tag team championships as she confirms that women's world tag team championships would be coming very soon to AEW. Along those same lines, another change will be coming to the company and following talks with Tony and another unnamed person, Tuesday Night Dynamite will see certain concerns regarding the balance of power within AEW addressed as the company continues to grow and improve on their successful six months in operation. Just before that main event, an in-depth video package will look at the rivalry between the two tag teams. When AEW was formed, the Young Bucks vowed to make tag team wrestling a main event attraction. Through that time, the Lucha Bros have proved themselves to be the team capable of making that goal achievable. The only team who have consistently proved themselves to be able to match the Young Bucks' incredible ability as a tag team, they also represent Nick and Matt's deepest rivals. In having a team capable of reaching their level, the Young Bucks may have gotten exactly what they wanted in having the first AW World Tag Team Championship match in the main event, but they also face the tough prospect of not fulfilling what they feel is their destiny, becoming the first AW World Tag Team Champions in the company that they were founding fathers of. And that main event gets a 65 C rating, not really what we were hoping for, at least a C plus, a B minus would have been nice, 77, 68, 78 and 88, so there's something gone wrong, perhaps there the psychology that lacks the commentating, the announcing, still the match got the crowd buzzing and gained heat for the storyline, but it's not really what we wanted to see anyway a superb match that had only a decent reaction again that is something i'm really struggling on getting the crowd up for these main events the lucha bros defeating the young bucks in 17 minutes and 25 pentagon beating nick jackson by apparently a top rope styles clash the lucha bros winning the aw men's tag team titles becoming the first team to hold that title nick jackson head and shoulders above everybody else the story of the match was that it seemed destiny, it seemed like fate that the Young Bucks would be the first title holders, the company that they founded, the tag team titles that they were so desperately pushing to be in the main event. But we've gone for a twist on that with the Lucha Bros picking up the victory. With Kenny Omega as the first men's world champion, we didn't just want the elite to have a clean sweep. And I think the Lucha Bros, despite falling a little bit short on the ratings there, are definitely the team to build this division around. Following the match, the Lucha Bros celebrate with their tag team titles. The commentators putting over that everything seemed to be in place for the Young Bucks to main event the show to win the titles, but the Lucha Bros caused something of an upset, becoming the first AEW World Tag Team Champions to close out AEW 
full house. So there is a 69 C plus rating. It does increase our popularity in 30 regions and it is a good rating for a show for the size that we're at currently. But nonetheless, it does feel like a missed opportunity. Could I have put Pac and Kenny Omega in the main event? Does the story that we were trying to tell, we put in the tag team titles on that main event level, supersede the fact that we may have lost a few ratings in the overall? I'd say that I'm still happy with that just because it still fulfills our broadcast requirements, it still increases our popularity, and going forward, the Lucha Bros will have certainly gained something from winning against the Young Bucks in the main event of Full House. Tuesday Night Dynamite going next, and out of this pay-per-view, we want to keep that momentum going, so hopefully that will come sooner rather than later. 